Hey everyone, welcome back. Excited this week to talk about Forgeborn and Forgeborn abilities. If you've been following some of the other content creators this week, you've started to see uh, some of the blighted Forgeborn come into uh, focus here this week. Uh, I'll start with the reveal on Monday of the uh, article showing the blighted Sunder. We're going to do a recap of Blighted Sunder, our thoughts on that, and then we are going to move into uh, spoiling the queen herself, or should we say the future queen of Solace. Um, Greg, what did you think of that article, and what did you think just kind of about the uh, Blighted Forgeborn mechanics as a whole, talking about, uh, we're going to show it here in a minute, but essentially your Forgeborn is going to get to play an Exalt, and when you meet the requirements of that Exalt, your Forgeborn then becomes Exalted. Yeah, I think it's a uh, it's a it, it seems to be an interesting mechanic. I'm curious to see where they go with this now, having seen Cersei's and comparing that to Sunders, and I'm curious what the others are going to be. You know, probably by the time this launches, I'll have a chance to see them, but we have not yet. It could mm -hmm. get pretty crazy, like just looking at some of the possibilities, and we're only seeing a subset of the abilities that can get, you know, supercharged or blighted, I guess. Um, so, you know, reading the article, it talks about how each of the uh, Soulbind Forgeborns will have, what is it, uh, six, three abilities. Six besides, combinations. Six combinations, abilities, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And then each Soulbind Forgeborn has one that only they can have and their other version cannot, it sounds like to me. And so what those abilities are, and how they supercharge them. I mean, I I, I doubt Oros is going to get Dark Force Drain, but could you imagine that being supercharged? <laughs> yeah, it's what not, is it then? The in, Blight Forge Drain? Or, it oh won't boy, be, it wouldn't imagine. be as impactful because what makes it really good is abusing it in the cycle two and being able to guarantee it, right? But like... Well, what I could, could see it being, though, is how many spells or creatures are in your discard pile or something. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, yeah, something like, just, just absolutely bonkers. multiplies yeah, it. Just, like, yeah, that's a good point. You could just oh. count your creatures as well. So you just need one big, big go off to right. make it work. We are getting a little bit deep into the mechanics, and maybe I should have started with another question first. So let's back <laughs> it up. You know, you and I love to dig into lore, so we got to talk about this a little bit. We both went down to Gen Con storyline event with the intent to affect the storyline. You had a plan. You wanted Oros to become blighted. You were kind of championing his uh, usage of the Dark Force drain, <laughs> trying to put a spotlight on it, if you will. Uh, I was down there to ensure that Cersei remained, um, in my mind, uh, you know, uh, separate of the Blight. In my opinion, I thought uh, Cersei stood the best chance for all of the factions, all of the champions, uh, to actually defend against the Blight because she had a kind of what appeared to be, outside of Nyxtakai, a stranglehold on her faction, which kind of allowed her to consolidate power, and I thought she could fight off the Blight that way. Um, so now we fast forward a little bit, Greg, and we learn... That Cersei, you know, you were you successfully got Oros blighted, or so we thought, and uh, um, then Necrium won the forge. So I thought that was great. We kind of achieved our goals or what we set out to do. Uh, fast forward now, we know that Oros is blighted, uh, but we also find out that Cersei's blighted, and not only is Cersei blighted, but now Ironbeard, uh, who wasn't even at the World Storyline <laughs> event, is now blighted. Uh, it does feel a little bit as if these were all predestined to occur, and we we aren't quite sure what agency we had over the storyline event as a whole. So, what are your thoughts there? It honestly a little disappointed, like not knowing what the agency was, you know. And again, I'm going to go back to my uh, L, you know, L five R days, you know. And anytime you went into a story story tournament or were prepping for a story tournament or uh, just story events because they did a lot of things that were just like small tournaments and they just added up across everybody in, in the region or the or the world you right. knew what you needed to do to impact the story you knew what you needed to do to not, not have a negative impact for your you know your clan and that really wasn't told to us at mm -hmm. uh at gen con and so i was a little you know a little frustrated with that but you know it kind of got the premise you know, it felt like that was, if you give into this temptation, you can, you know, get the blight to occur. And, you know, after the thing we heard about Sunder and Oros, and it kind of made sense from Sunder from some previous tournaments mm -hmm. that I wasn't in, Oros, you know, I know that there was 
uh, at least two of us strongly trying to use our temptation every game. You know, I use it every game, and, and Nathan, I think he's it all but one. And so there were a lot of, you know, some more, other Oris players I've talked to that were also trying to use their temptations. And I, you know, Ironbird wasn't even at the tournament. <laughs> he's just back at all with the blight, orchestrating, you know. <laughs> you know, so it it does feel a little bit like some of that was, you know, already premeditated, predetermined and to kind of remove some of the agency from the players and, and seeing now Cersei get blighted and Ironbeard get blighted as well, you know, raises the question, what was ultimately the impact? Right. And, and we talked to George. And so we know that, you know, the, the landscape of the storyline, there, there has to be certain waypoints that are predetermined to kind of help guide an overarching story, be it with a lot of player agency. That's the expectation we were kind of given. So I think what we're, we're both kind of thinking here is just uh, have that agency uh, laid out bare, plain. Hey, you come to story, you know, a storyline event. If um, your forge born is Sunder and you give into the temptation the most, you know, you could be blighted or it doesn't even have to be that plain, but it, it, it should give players an idea of what to do. And that information should be given uh, far enough in advance for us to make uh well thought out decisions on what we want to do to gate to kind of help the storyline in whatever fashion we we choose to as players to actually have that interaction right yeah i, I agree and you know it's you know I, yeah I, you said it pretty well like especially having it kind of up front so we can make these decisions and, and build decks and decide how we want to you know go to this tournament or what we can do or what we can champion other players to do right so that, that's also part of a social dynamic is there's a lot of like yeah. hey could you go to the tournament and play this like hey let's work together all you know i would know, love so. to see that raise the necrium banner right we'll scream it from the top of the the corner over here you know bring the necrium faction you'll scream for you tara we'll try to rally our sides and everyone shows up at the storyline like gangs in new york try to figure out exactly what we're you know gonna brawl over um that could be a lot of fun i, I hear exactly what you're saying there um so, you know, that's just our, our kind of thoughts. We, we love the storyline aspect of this game. One of the biggest draws, hands down. I would love to bring uh, any deck that kind of supports the, the mechanism that I would like to see the story move towards. Um, and it's just a fun idea to, you know, involve different deck choices and things of that nature. Um, so with that, let's jump right into this, Greg. And uh, we'll pull up um, Sunder here. And so we're looking at the Blighted Sunder, um, or Exalted, uh, this, this is the Blighted Sunder, I think. I think once they flip, they become Exalted. Uh, so the Cycle 2 ability is play Scoring Stones. This was in the article, and Scoring Stones is an Exalt that at the start of the turn, if there is no enemy creature in this lane, put an Energy Counter on this. Then if there are three or more Energy Counters on this, transform this and overlay Sunder with this. So this is kind of just asking you to dominate a lane, um, in my opinion, Throw down something big and nasty in it and force your opponent to choose to deal with it or not, knowing that the consequences is that you'll be able to exalt your Sunder. Um, and you go through these abilities here. Um, if you do not flip uh, the exalt, right, if you don't get to the point where you get to transform scoring stones and overlay it over your Sunder, your abilities are your Frost Axe, and this looks like to be the unique one only to the Blighted Sunder. Uh, choose an enemy creature when it is dealt damage this turn destroy it um, does not seem overwhelming for a cycle three and then gathering storm uh, cycle four when you play a spell this turn you lay damage to a creature or player we know this can be a game ender so this is still a solid ability uh greg i'm gonna let you talk about the exalt your opinions on it and then cover the now uh revealed here blighted sunder right next to its its uh unexalted state abilities yeah, so uh, so the thing with it, yeah, right. You're you're getting so you brought up the frost axe, for instance, right? Like kind of under world for set three, you can always just kind of look at like death touch as a as a comparison. You don't have to damage it; you could probably kill it. Now, this isn't level gated or anything. Um, I can't remember if death touch is at cycle three or not, but yeah, it is. So so a little bit of difference there. Gathering storm, as you mentioned, game changer. Um, you know, and then the, the thing with the playing the scores and stones, you get no benefit out of it right away. So it's not like an immediate impact that you can 
make a change in the direction of the game. So there's something to keep in mind on that. But when you do flip it, whether it's in cycle two, three, or four, when this is transformed, you may deal five damage to a creature, right? So not not necessarily um, the most impactful. You're probably hitting this off in cycle three. So, which then gives you access to Bloodbath, which is choose two enemy creatures when either of those creatures will damage this turn, destroy it. So, kind of um, could be helpful for getting rid of some bigger nasties, you know, that you know you're going to damage um, for the turn. Or And then Shadowbound, when you play this spell, deal eight damage to an enemy creature and an enemy player. Um, so, you're going to do eight damage to both of them every time you play a spell. And so when we first kind of, when I talked about it, I was like, man, this is this is really good. And then you kind of, you brought to my attention like, well, here's what some of the other abilities could be from another to another faction. And to the fact that usually if you're getting Gathering Storm off, most of the times either you're going to be able to just at that point in Cycle 4 just directly kill the player with the 8 damage anyways, ignoring the creatures. Um, or you're just clearing out creatures and then just winning the game that way, right? So... There's obviously a very high upside to Shadowbound, but I think it's going to be more in that middle of it's not necessarily going to, you know, the difference between Gathering to Storm and Shadowbound is not as big. Frost Axe to Bloodbath, it's one extra creature, and then you're you're delaying your cycle two into a lesser ability potentially. So depending on what other Sunders are. Right. It, I, I was I was high, and then you you brought some of these things to my thought process, and I was like, well, maybe I'm not as high, you know. I, I think it could have its uses, but looking at Cersei, I don't think it's as clear cut. Yeah, and I, I do think you bring up a good point about the other the other Sunder makeups. I'm super excited to see Stimbolt. I don't know if that's come back, but that could really I think flip some uh, flip the paradigm uh, and be really powerful depending on how that turns out. Um, because, you know, especially those abilities, uh, Dark Force Drain is one of them, Greg, you know, where it doesn't actually power up over cycles because it's already that good. Uh, well, what could its blighted version be? Um, you know, and, and you brought up Dark Force Drain earlier and that got me thinking about Stimbolt. So all of these Forge Warn abilities that are just kind of, you get what you get no matter what cycle they roll at, those ones seem very interesting to me when they become blighted. So here, let's move into uh, Cersei. So here's our first look at uh, the exalted uh, Cersei, um, or soulbound Cersei. I, I got to figure out exactly what we're calling these things before they, they blight. Um, but so cycle two is you play your Bones of Solace. Uh, Bones of Solace, when your creature's in this lane, uh, when your creature in this lane is destroyed, put an energy counter on this. Then if there are four or more energy counters on this, transform this and overlay Cersei. So this is really playing into a lot of the things that Necrim already wants to do. So if you have ways to destroy your creatures, this is really going to play into it very well. Um, I don't think it it's as powerful at level 2 as Sunders was, because Sunders gives you that little bit of lane control mechanism. Uh, I, I put the 13-2 Raptor in it, and uh, you have to choose to take 13 damage every turn. Or kill this and give me an energy charge, right? I think you got those. I think you got those mixed up. Like thir the thirteen two raptor in Sunders guarantees that whatever they put in there, they're going to you're going to clear it because if they don't put a creature in there, you get the benefit. If they put a creature in there, the thirteen two can kill the creature and then their host. So they need a they need a much bigger creature in there to be able to oh, block it. You're a hundred percent. Cersei's right. is like like yeah. Do you do you let me get these overpowered abilities that we're going to see here in a minute, or do you just let me keep punching you in the face for you know massive damage? And they're gonna go, well, I I gotta block that. Yeah. Uh, and if you put something with low health, you know that they're then they're happening. To, yeah. Then you got that lane control piece. Like. Yep. Exact. Sorry. Yeah. I I flipped these things 180 <laughs> degrees. You're 100 percent correct. So this one gives you a lot of lane control mechanics. This is one where you just put something there and. Um, if your opponent doesn't kill it, you just get a hit face every time, right? And then Necrim gives you enough abilities that you can kill one or two creatures pretty easily yourself. Uh, so after a while, they probably have to deal with it. Uh, this one does seem pretty easy to flip. Um, my one other thought on Sunder is that we know Tempest has the Energizing Forge Word, which does put energy counters onto Exalts, so that could help you flip oh, that a little easier. 
I didn't even think of that. Yeah, you could put an energy counters on that thing to give it flip it really quick, you know. Yep. Um, one other thought before we go into this. So someone brought up to me when when they first saw the article, uh, you know, Mantis and Ford Seal are back on the table. Uh, not that they were ever off the table. Let's let's be honest. They they are the hallmark of a lot of amazing decks. Um, but their their opinion was let's get these exalts out in cycle one and start early the process of flipping them. Um, and absolutely, I agree that that's not a bad thing, but I don't think the curvature of flipping these things is going to be that difficult. Um, I, yeah, unless but, you get it out late in cycle two, then you're in trouble. So the Mantis and the Ford Seal just makes it a little bit more consistent. Well, not only does it make it more consistent, we're getting like supercharged ability. So now they're able to hit that supercharged ability. Yes. Like, to, like, so, so we have, you have Cersei up here on screen, right? So what are your thoughts on just soul swap at level at cycle four? So soul swap at cycle four, switch the health of two creatures. I think this is a very subpar, um, ability, especially because it can affect Krogius, right? Yeah. Um, not a little bit of a joke, but obviously not. Um, you know, this, this powerful Forgeborn can't affect the one creature. Okay, but I, I don't think it's very good. Like, it, I could give you not, a Wisp with 14 health and get rid of your Packmaster. That's great, but I would rather just have Death Touch to remove the Packmaster, you know, or, or whatever it may be. Yeah, uh, you're, it, it's not going to like four, it's not level games. gated. Right. Yeah, and, and at most, it's going to let you trade out evenly. Like, yeah. Uh, I think I know where you're going with this, so we're going to flip down <laughs> to the the Blighted or the Exalted. Um, so this is Bones of Solace. Um, let's take a moment to appreciate the transform ability name Neil before Cersei. Right? <laughs> we all know that this is the future Queen of Solace. We just have to unfortunately understand that we are not all now members of the Blight. Um, I didn't want to be there. I fought to not be there, but now I've assimilated and it's fine. Um, so... As soon as you flip Bones of Solace um, and you transform uh, and then overlay with Cersei, you just get to do, you know, um, basically a life drain that was a cycle three variant before deal six damage to an enemy player to gain six health. Yeah, um, like, that's good. It doesn't that get means... to do it to a creature, so it's a, it's a little bit worse, but because um, yeah. typically you target a creature with this ability, but um, still pretty good. Yeah, it's 12, 12 point health swing. I'll take it these th things start to get a little off the rail here um now dark rebirth let's everyone avert your eyes from soul reaver because that's the real crazy one but dark rebirth is is so much fun to me and it's just insane destroy one of your creatures to reanimate a creature and give it eight attack eight health so you're destroying a creature but then if you want to bring that creature back like go for it shoot uh, or bring back a better friend instead and give that thing plus eight plus eight Soul Siphon is a really amazing ability, but I've been stuck with it a lot of times with only one creature on the board and not being able to use it. Yeah, I much prefer Soul Siphon either at, at Tier 2 or, or at Cycle 2 or Cycle 4. Mm -hmm. um, but but this is huge. And and they probably didn't hear anything that you stated because you brought their attention to Soul Reaver, which <laughs> is just bonkers. So they've been reading that and like thinking, oh my God, while you were talking about uh, Dark Rebirth, which in effect is also a very good uh, ability which could end games in cycle three <laughs> so yeah. you know and and we had to bring up the mantis now because actually doing soul reaver twice i don't know that that's that great but doing dark rebirth twice and having the mantis on a stick to sacrifice that is amazing yeah i mean could you imagine doing soul reaver in cycle three with the mantis that's true. Yeah, you could get it above her. <laughs> You're of like, curve. hey, uh, I'm going to play this Mantis. Uh, you now have three hit points, and my Mantis now has 40 hit points, and, and then I just... Yeah. Any of the handful... Mantis will eventually get through. <laughs> or just any of the handful of purple <laughs> yeah. cards that you have that deal direct damage. Like, <laughs> Right, right. Um, <laughs> absolutely. So uh, I think everyone can see that... Uh, you know, these abilities start to go off the rails, uh, which is something we're kind of used to in Soul Forge. that cycle three, the, the, you know, the limiter starts to come off, and by cycle four, we're driving without a steering wheel sometimes in this game, and um, I think this just kind of continues that. Um, uh, 
I yeah. wonder if we are uh, going to force the game into two mechanisms. Uh, one, uh, like if you can, a hyper control mechanism to ensure that uh, players cannot flip their um, exalted. Uh, and and if you do, is that really enough? Because can you still then win the game on top of that? And then two, or are we just going pure aggression? Uh, which is really what the beginning of Soul Forge Fusion looked like, in my opinion. As soon as everyone realized what Krogius was, how you could cheat it out, everyone went to hyper aggression, and we were ending games as quick as possible. And then set two came out, and we kind of settled into a more nuanced version um, of aggression. I still think we're, we're kind of pushing that, but there are decks that last longer as well. Uh, because you get the more highly tuned life gain or blue stall decks that can get Krogius out or or other mechanisms and then you have the hyper aggressive uh, realm of spark to kind of fight it so um, I, that's my take on what these might do to the meta but without knowing all of set three and really seeing how it interacts with other sets as well I'm not sure where this is going to lead us yeah, it's going to get really interesting seeing. I mean, you could just look at the, you know, we, we've all seen the Thunder now, and now you can see it compared against the Cersei. Like, what other shenanigans or, like like I said, on the other Forgeborns, how crazy are they going to get? Um, I mean, I know I know me personally, I'm going to be digging for a Soul Reaver. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, it, it, that feels like an instant win, potentially. Um, yeah. But I, I'm very curious to see what the other Forgeborn abilities are going to do in their Blighted State. Um, I do wonder if this is going to drive up the um, cost of competition. Um, because before, we've all been fishing for the high roll decks in one shape or form. Set 2 brought it to where you're you're fishing for a high roll deck with a particular soul bind. Now we might be fishing for a high roll deck with a soul bound uh, creature or spell or card and a soul bind. Um, Forgeborn, I don't even know if that's possible yet, if you can have both. That might be a big limiting factor if you yeah, only it, have one because this takes the extra card slot. Which which would be my interpretation, but maybe maybe there is a possibility for two, but it seems like this you would only have this as your soul bind rather than... And so is this 25% of the decks that you'll have us... that your soul bind could be a Cersei yeah, for Necrium? And- and then, you know, if we get abilities like this, are we asking for overpowered soulbinds to come back into the game? Like, do we want to see RSE come back into the game so that way you're not uh, instantly sad when you see a non-soulbound uh, Forgeborn, right? Um, yeah. I, I just think there's a lot of interesting wrinkles there. Very curious to see how it comes out. I think these uh, were very well-timed by Stoneblade to save these uh and kind of trickle out a bunch of set three cards before we get to this, because reading these cards has given me a little bit of hype back. I'll be honest, I'm, I would be excited to try these out. Um, so, Stoneblade, if you're listening, and you're going to do another set three uh, release, um, if it's a weekend, I hope I can make it. But uh, weeknights, I that's my best <laughs> bet. Uh, but no, either way, I've I've loved the set three uh, release events. Greg's gotten to take part in a couple of them. Yeah, um, they're, they're a blast. Like, I, I I really think that this is, like, for for uh, Seal, that I've enjoyed it the most out of, all, you know, either set one Seal or set two, set three, I think, you know. So that so bar keeps coming up every set, so that's, that's good. I, like, that feels good. Yeah, I, I have yet to play with the set three. I'm super excited. I love when you get a bunch of fun interactions. And, um, you know, Greg, if you're telling me this is a funner set sealed than set two, I'm super excited um, because set two is, is in my opinion, a lot more fun to play sealed than set one. Um, and if set three is going to get better, that that is a good trajectory for the game that I'm excited about, um, which is awesome. So I think uh, that'll wrap us up here um, for tonight's episode. A couple of throwouts I do want to put out there. You know, not a lot of times do we, we ask for Patreon support or try to try to shill for money. We'll do it again here. Um, we got a lot of things in the works. We're trying to bring, um, you know, fun events to the community, um, alt art cards that we find, um, you know, fun for various reasons or that are, are, are key for certain aspects. Uh, and so all of that's paid through Patreon money. None of it goes to our pockets. Um, so if you want to support us, the, the links in the description, please do so. Uh, the other thing I want to do a throw out is we're about to get into the set two uh, quick card uh, thoughts and 
a lot of those are going to come straight from the comments of the videos. So thanks, uh, Mandungu, Gorgeous. You know, we got your uh, recommendations for cards that you would love to hear about. Uh, and so those are in the hopper. If anyone else wants to hear about any cards, you know, just just respond to the videos and, and tell us what you're thinking about. Um, with that being said, we appreciate you coming to this channel. You know, please like, subscribe uh, if you enjoy the content. It really helps. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for attending this lesson of the Forgeborn Finishing School. If you like this video, please subscribe, comment, or consider donating to our Patreon account. We look forward to our next lesson.